I'm Patty Pillsbury, the director of Brownell Library. Welcome to our uh, first Wednesday in Essex Junction. Uh, we are delighted tonight to have um, Rolf Diamant, who is Superintendent Emeritus of the Mar uh, Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park, Vermont's only national park, and one with a strong narrative connection to the Civil War. From June through October, the park offered a popular walking tour, Causes and Consequences, the Civil War home front um, through the center of Woodstock Village. Rolf writes and speaks on American history and conservation, and he's a member of the Vermont Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission. He's the recipient of the 2007 National Park Service Civic Engagement Award for his leadership role in connecting the park and the community in a shared exploration of nearly forgotten history. We are so fortunate to have the uh, Vermont Humanities Council sponsor this program. I'm gonna introduce um, Dottie Bergendahl, who's the president of our Brownell Library Foundation, with a mention of a couple other important local sponsors. Dottie. Thank you. Uh, since these uh, flyers have been printed, we have received a grant from IBM, part of which is going towards paying the funding for this. We have been told by the friends of the Brownell Library that they will again help sponsor this program. They are having a book sale next week. <laughs> Come and do your Christmas shopping. <laughs> They're beautiful things. Also, Covort, Overton, and Wilson are sponsoring the program here as we host these first Wednesday programs. And those three names, if you're familiar with the village, have all been important in the development of the Brownell Library and its ongoing process and, and importance to Essex Junction. So thank you for being here. Watch for our raffle next month and you'll get to bid on our raffle prizes on the day before the train hop. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Whoop, all right, that's good. Yeah, why not? We're gonna start with some slides, but I wanna make sure everyone can, can hear me in the back. Is that, am I sounding pretty good? You know, I, I have a voice that can carry if I push it. So just, just let me know. Um, well, I, I really appreciate this invitation from the Brunel Library and from the Vermont Humanities Council. Um, you know, I, they, they suggested this date uh, sometime back in the spring of, uh, and uh, you know, I said November 7th, that sounds okay to me. My calendar looked good. And you know, they, they, we agreed on a, uh, on a topic, talk a little bit about the, uh, the Civil War and the politics behind the Emancipation Proclamation and, and you know, uh, politics with a small p. And I just slipped my mind that November 6th was probably people had about all the politics they'd ever want uh, for a while. So uh, uh, forgive me if uh, uh, we, we do talk a little bit about politics, but we'll take it back about 150 years ago. Um, and what I'd like to talk about tonight, and as I, as I uh, show you some slides and we, uh, we get into this a little bit, uh, you know, feel free if there's something that, you know, you really don't understand, you know, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, I've timed this so it's, it's reasonably compact and there'll be plenty of time at the end also to have a little bit of conversation. This is what I would call unsettled history. And I think that's what makes the Civil War so engaging for people today is that we're constantly learning. 150 years and we're still learning more and more about what went on and what were the causes and what were the consequences of that war. Um, you know, it just astounds me uh, just this year how much new scholarship has come out. Um, and some of the things I'm gonna talk about, in particular Abraham Lincoln and uh, his political triangulation, if you will, to uh, move forward with the Emancipation Proclamation is part of that unsettled history. There's new information that's just this year has come out in a couple of uh, very fine books that have been recently published. Um, so this is still a work in progress. Uh, and, and it's not surprising that 
the Civil War remains uh, an issue that people want to engage in and they want to learn more about. Uh, my talk is going to be focused on, oh, I'm trying to find a new analogy. I was thinking of three weather systems. But given you know, the terrible storms we've had, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to come up with something different. But if you bear with me, um, what I mean by weather systems is there are really three theaters of activity that are going on somewhat in, independent of each other, but very much interdependent. And they're having great influence on each other. They're all sort of moving in the same direction, if you will, but they're, they're constantly interacting. And those three theaters or weather systems are as follows. One is um, Abraham Lincoln and his administration. The other is public opinion, in particular the Congress. And the third is the war, the war itself. Because I'm talking about uh, the Emancipation Proclamation 150 years ago today, 1862, we're in 2012, 150 years ago, the war is already um, well over, uh, well into its second year. Uh, certainly by the time uh, of the fall of uh, uh, November, October, September of 1862, uh, the war, war is into its 13th, 14th, 15th month. So that the war itself and how the war unfolds, both deliberately and I would say its unintended consequences that no one planned on, begins to have a, 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 it's a weather system of its own. It's changing facts on the ground, and those facts are influencing the political world of this country. Um, so that, uh, yes, Lincoln is proceeding along some line of logic and, and uh, calculation. The Congress is moving in its, sort of its own trajectory, but facts on the ground are constantly changing. Uh, the, the first, uh, I'll start with the war a little bit, just to ground us. The first event that occurs in, in the, how the war influences the Emancipation Proclamation and ultimately the 13th Amendment and the abolish, abolition of the abolishment of, of, of slavery in the United States uh, happens almost uh, before the war even begins. For those in back, that's a, a, a slide of uh, the Newport area of Virginia. That's Fortress Monroe. That is, uh, there was a series of Union forts um, along the coast. Uh, the United States held on to most of them. Some of them were taken over, Fort Sumter being the most um, uh, famous of them uh, was, was seized, uh, it, 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 it triggered hostilities, the attack on uh, the United States garrison there, but in fact there were other forts, um, uh, Fortress Monroe on the coast of Virginia, um, there's Fort Taylor in the Florida Keys, and Fort Pickens uh, uh, just outside of uh, Pensacola that stay in Union hands. And Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortuga is another key fort that stays in Union hands. And so this, the story begins with Fort Monroe, and it starts in April 61, uh, actually the very day that Virginia finally ratifies its Ordinance of Secession. So Virginia has just pulled out of the Union literally within hours. Uh, three uh, slaves. Um, who have been put to work building fortifications across from Fortress Monroe, Confederate works, um, expropriate a rowboat and row like hell for, to, the, to the Union flag. Uh, and, and this is, um, is, is uh, you know, the, the, the very day of secession. Um, now, this had happened before, even before uh, Fort Sumter had fallen. There had been a number of occasions where African Americans who were enslaved decided that, you know, there was a change coming and they made for the closest Union outpost. Um, in the case of uh, Pensacola and in the case of uh, uh, Fort Taylor in, in, in Key West, they were, they were taken in by the garrison, they were uh, confined 
And then they, the next day, they were marched back to the uh, mainland and turned over to the sheriff and essentially returned into slavery. Uh, these posts were carrying out the Federal uh, Fugitive Slave Act, and uh, that was the law of the land. So when these three guys made it over to Fortress Monroe um, in April of 1861, they were, taking, they were just taking their chances. Um, however, much to their good fortune, they were met by a sentry uh, who was uh, from the 1st Vermont. And the 1st Vermont was commanded by uh, a fellow named um, this gentleman over here, John Walcott Phelps. He was a colonel at that point, 1st Vermont. Phelps was a professional soldier. He was from Guilford, um, West Pointer, uh, professional army, um, Vermonter, uh, also very strongly anti-slavery. Um, instead of being arrested and, or returned, they were actually taken, uh, these three uh, fugitives were taken, and this is a picture for those in front, probably see it a little more clearly. They're taken to the commander, Benjamin Butler, of the fort, and Butler makes a very critical decision that um, he is not going to return these three guys, that in fact, uh, when he finds out that they were just the very, that very day uh, employed as slaves but building fortifications to shoot at his fort, um, he says, no, no, uh, no luck, I'm not returning them. Uh, in fact, there's a, um, the owner, who's a Confederate officer, sends a, uh, a representative over to reclaim his property. And Butler says, well, I'll return these three gentlemen if you take a loyalty oath to the United States. And, of course, um, that's declined. And, of course, Butler knows you can't have it both ways. You can't uh, essentially become a foreign country or claim to be a foreign country and still seek the protection of the laws of the United States, it, one or the other, but not both. Um, so this is a, um, a picture of uh, uh, Butler receiving these three guys, and he says, um, and this was later a quote that's attributed to Abraham Lincoln by his Secretary of Navy, Gideon Wells, the rebels could not at the same time throw off the Constitution and invoke its aid. So that's a very early on critical distinction, and it becomes the basis for the first step towards emancipation, which is the decision that any slave who finds their way to the Union Army and can show that they were working uh, uh, essentially at war against the United States, uh, against the Union, uh, would not be returned, in fact, would be protected. Um, there's a cartoon um, uh, of, the, uh, of the time, that's General Butler. Um, and uh, what happens, of course, is as soon as uh, word gets out, uh, there's uh, not just a few people seeking the protection of Fortress Monroe. In fact, it becomes, it's, becomes nicknamed Freedom's Fortress. It becomes a sanctuary for, for hundreds, if not thousands, of fugitive slaves. Um, now, uh, Congress uh, is loath to take any action this early on against slavery, but um, as soon as the first battle of Bull Run occurs, and there's a, 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 an awareness in the North, and particularly in Congress, that this whole enterprise, this whole war, was not going to be wrapped up in 90 days. Remember that 1st Vermont was a 90-day regiment, and they, they really thought that the, how, somehow this war would be resolved in a few months. Um, uh, but after the Battle of Bull Run, if there was any um, uh, concept that that was, that was going to happen, it was erased pretty quickly. Um, and there was, there's a hardening of attitudes in Congress, and there's uh, a, a, a weariness beginning to uh, sink in that this could be a long and bloody struggle. And as a result, they uh, pick up on what Butler has done, and they pass what's called the First Confiscation Act. And what it says is that it's simply that uh, it's an act to confiscate any property, slaves in this case, that is used for the purpose of insurrection and rebellion. 
Now, back to Vermont. Now, Vermont takes a, an early step in uh, early in 1862, in February of 1862. It's clear that these 90-day regiments haven't worked. They need troops for the long haul. Lincoln makes another request to Vermont, and Vermont's prepared to send, this time, a lot more troops. But they, they attach a caveat, and uh, they, uh, the General Assembly in Montpelier passes a resolution which says, no Vermont soldiers, you can have these troops, fight for the Union, but they were not in any case to ever be used to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, and uh, they go on to say that employ them, to employ them for such a purpose would be highly offensive to the honor and dignity of the state. Well, it doesn't take too much time before uh, so goes Vermont, so goes the nation. Um, and in fact, um, uh, steps are taken, uh, number one, in uh, March, um, the, the Army actually is officially prohibited from enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, the next month, Congress abolishes slavery in the District of Columbia. That was, a, if you will, low-hanging fruit. That was easy to do because the United States government ruled the District of Columbia. Uh, they didn't have to deal with any states. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they, they could take that action but it sets a precedent. Uh, the following uh, June, uh, two months later, uh, they, they take the steps in all those Western territories also to abolish slavery because again, the, the national government has control there. And in July, they actually pass a second version of the Confiscation Act, which is broader and uh, more forceful, which says that any slave, whether they're working on fortifications or the war effort or laborers or any um, war related, it doesn't matter. All they have to do is make it to federal lines and they will not be returned. They will be given sanctuary. It doesn't say that it would be given citizenship. It doesn't say, uh, it really address anything about the future, but it simply says that uh, if they make it to the protection of the United States flag, they will not be returned as slaves if they are fleeing people who are in rebellion against the United States. That's the caveat. And then um, the, the same day they pass this new Confiscation Act, they pass one other piece of legislation. They amend something called the 1795 Militia Act. And, and that's just sort of broad authority to raise troops in time of war. But they, they add a, a, a caveat to that amendment which says that it gives the authority to the president and it gives the authority to the de uh, War Department um, that they can use black, uh, black men, African Americans, for any military or naval service for which they may be found competent. It doesn't say they would be trained as infantry or, or use the Navy or, or it doesn't specify. It's just a broad blanket authority. Now, let's go back to Vermont. We'll go back to this uh, theater of uh, the real, uh, the war itself. Um, I'm gonna talk just for a few minutes about a, a little known um, corner of the Civil War that Vermont got very deeply involved in. And it's not talked about a lot because most of the fighting that Vermonters did was in Virginia. It was with um, the Army of the Potomac. That was the main theater of war. But in uh, winter of 1862, there's an expedition sent to, um, recruited to uh, attack the Confederacy in the very deep south, actually to go all the way around um, into the Gulf of New Mexico and uh, attack uh, New Orleans and move up the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and they, uh, they put together a, a New England division to undertake the uh, military side of this, the, the, the terrestrial side of it. It's an Army-Navy operation. And they recruit uh, two regiments of Vermont troops, and those are the Vermont 7th Infantry and the Vermont 8th. 7th and 8th are recruited. Um, for this venture, and that's their camp in uh, Brattleboro, um, Camp Holbrook, that's named after one of their commanding officers. Um, this, these two regiments are raised statewide because Vermont's a, you know, 
pretty reasonably small state, um, and they, they brought troops from almost every corner of the state into each of these units. Um, but this, these troops are raised in February and trained. They, they're mustered in and trained in, in you know, sort of waist-high snow. And, and, and this is very going to be hard to get your minds around, but in a matter of less than a month, less than 30 days, they are going to travel from the snowdrifts of Brattleboro to the bayous of Louisiana. It's mind-boggling. It's almost like a trip to the moon. They embark on uh, railroad uh, uh, trains uh, down to New York City. Uh, in New York City, they uh, board transports for the journey. Uh, you know, they, they weren't going to fight their way all the way to New Orleans. They were going to sail most of it. And so uh, they take off for New Orleans, and this is uh, a brutal trip for them. Uh, I, you know, you really think about Vermonters. They're not really a seafaring culture. Um, and it's a rough, rough journey. Uh, and someone writes, I think they write, dead calm and dead sick. And this is just to show you the uh, focus really on the larger illustration, that they have to come all the way down the eastern seaboard tuck around the, the Florida Keys and um, head for the Gulf uh, to get to Louisiana. And once they're in the Gulf, uh, there's a small strip of a tiny little uh, beach, tiny little island off the coast of Mississippi, uh, very close to um, New Orleans. And that's where uh, they, uh, they, they essentially land there, uh, get ready for the invasion. And uh, so they're on this tiny little island. It's called Ship Island. Um, it's now part of Gulf Islands National Seashore, for anyone who's ever been down there. Um, and then they're, uh, they're embarked again, um, and they're part of the invasion force, which uh, um, fights its way through the head of the passes, which there are two, two forts that have been taken over by the Confederacy. They essentially... Um, the Union Navy Farragut sort of shoots his way through the forts. I'm not going to talk about this uh, beyond saying that the, the Vermonters followed in Farragut's wake and end up landing just outside of New Orleans. Um, this is a, a drawing of the time of the uh, first Marines uh, landing uh, in New Orleans. New Orleans wasn't contested once those forts were passed. Um, New Orleans fell very quickly, almost without a shot. Um, and the Vermonters find themselves deep in the bayous of Louisiana in short order. And this was, must have been really the most uh, profound cultural challenge. You know, most of these guys hadn't likely been outside of their county, let alone their town. And here they were in Louisiana. Um, I, I love this little image. It says, um, engagement with a rebel ally, um, shooting an alligator. Um, but uh, this was uh, strange terrain indeed. Um, but what I am going to talk about is one of the uh, most uh, startling experiences for them, of course, is that they, uh, land, in, in a, they land in the heart of uh, the slave belt. Uh, these are uh, sugar plantations, some cotton plantations, mostly sugar plantations, uh, all around New Orleans. And almost as soon as there's a, a, not even the sight of uh, Union troops, but the rumor of Union troops, um, there is an effect self-emancipation that occurs. In other words, the slaves decide to take control of their lives, and they, 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 they stop working. They flee towards um, first a trickle, then um, more, and then finally a flood, you know, hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands, uh, flee to Vermont. Uh, to Union lines, and the Vermonters are on point. So their camp is um, the recipient of uh, um, thousands of fugitive slaves. And uh, the Vermonters also encounter slaves on their patrols. They, they, are, uh, they end up uh, visiting plantations. Uh, and, you know, they see the a side of slavery a lot of them have never seen. Uh, of course, they, most of them have probably uh, had no encounters with people of color uh, in any event. Um, and what they know about slavery is uh, uh, third hand, fourth hand. And so this is uh, a rude awakening. 
And this is from the diary of uh, Rufus Kingsley of the 8th Vermont. And I'll just read it very quickly. July 24th, 62, Sunday. Another Negro comes into our camp this morning wearing a 64-pound ball attached to his foot by a cable chain five feet long, such as used in Vermont for uh, hauling stone. He had traveled 40 miles, and then he writes in his diary, evening, have just um, filed from a Negro's neck an iron yoke weighing 13 pounds covered with long crooked prongs, which he has worn in the swamps during the last eight days. Um, so uh, in some cases, it's a very visceral and painful encounter with slavery. Um, this is their, uh, the site of their, their camp. Uh, you could see that, uh, you know, the state of Louisiana put a marker up, but uh, it's certainly not a, a, a sacred historic site in Louisiana. Um, and this goes to the heart of uh, the story here. And um, uh, this time, their commander is, uh, he's now been promoted as the same guy who was at Fortress Monroe, John Walcott Phelps. He's now a general. Um, and uh, Phelps decides he's going to, he's, 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 he's impatient for something to happen on slavery, and he's going to take matters into his own hands. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he's one of many officers in many federal units uh, that are being swamped by um, people fleeing for their lives, and they don't know what to do. It's a humanitarian crisis. They're not really set up to protect them or... or, or you know, that everything has to be improvised. And he writes to the, um, he writes complaining of this, that there's no action being taken by the War Department to respond to this great crisis. And then he has an idea of really how to use it to, his, to, to the government's advantage. And he says, I have now upwards of 300 Africans organized into five companies who are willing and ready to show their devotion to our cause in any way that may be put to the test. They are willing to submit to anything rather than slavery. And again, uh, this is before the Emancipation Proclamation. There's no policy uh, beyond this broad authority in the Militia Act to do anything in terms of using African Americans as federal soldiers or sailors. And Phelps is prepared to push the issue. And he wants guns, he wants uniforms, and he says he's going to train these guys and it's going to be the first of many regiments that are going to be raised. And this throws the War Department into a panic. They don't know what to do or how to respond. Phelps refuses to back down. Uh, finally, you know, in, in a fit of anger, uh, though I think he knows exactly what he's doing, he says, you gotta, I got to do this or accept my resignation. I will, I will hand in my commission. And uh, the War Department uh, finally... Um, just says, we'll accept your commission. And Phelps resigns uh, and heads back to Vermont. Uh, before he goes, he writes, um, and is a rather, inf inf uh, rather famous uh, uh, statement, is while I'm willing to prepare African regiments for the defense of the government against its assailants, I am not willing to become a, the mere slave driver, which you propose having no qualifications in any way. Uh, they, what they told Phelps was, you can't train these guys as soldiers. Use them as laborers. Have them you know, dig trenches for the army, but don't train them as soldiers. Well, one, one thing you can say about Phelps is that he was uh, prescient. I mean, he was maybe a, a little ahead of his time. In this case, he was ahead of his time, not by a, 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 a half a year, a year. He was ahead of his time probably by about six weeks. Because six weeks later, um, uh, another general, his commander in Louisiana, uh, decides he'd do just what he uh, punished Phelps for. He began to uh, train and arm black troops in Louisiana. Uh, this was also done uh, in uh, the outer, uh, not the Outer Banks, but the Sea Islands of South Carolina by a fellow officer, David Hunter. Uh, Hunter raises uh, the 1st South Carolina Volunteer Regiment, really one of the first black regiments in the Union Army, without any authority. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln is forced, again, to fire Hunter or move him, transfer him out of the, um, out of the uh, 
out of South Carolina. Um, Hunter, uh, however, very interesting, the regiment is kept under arms. In other words, it was a political move to remove Hunter, as it was Phelps, but you can see they're beginning to think that, in fact, they're going to need black troops and that these guys are just forcing the issue themselves. And in fact, Lincoln doesn't want to be squeezed. He wants to do this in his own time, his own way. And finally, in uh, um, the summer of 1862, after Phelps and Hunter are uh, moved and relieved of their commands, uh, Lincoln does act. He shares a, a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation with his cabinet. And th this is telling us a quote from Lincoln. He says, the government can no longer play a game in which it stakes all, and its enemies stake nothing. Those enemies must understand that they cannot experiment for 10 years trying to destroy the government, and if they fail, still come back into the Union unhurt. In other words, he's saying uh, it, the stakes are too high. The world has changed. We can't go back to what was there before. Um, you've made war against uh, the Union, and there, there is a cost for that. And there's a picture of Lincoln meeting with his cabinet and um, discussing he has man the draft Emancipation Proclamation. They, um, they convince him it is uh, too risky to announce the Emancipation Proclamation publicly at that point because the Union is losing the war. Or it's not losing the war, but it is, it is, it, there have been a series of military reverses, and if he releases it at a low point, it will seem like he was desperate. And this was uh, an act of desperation. Hold on until there's a success, a, sig a signal of success somewhere on the military front, and then you can move forward with it. And he agrees to do it. I only call your, your attention, because this is a great, this is a painting by Carpenter. Um, and um, there's a map in the corner of this painting. It's extraordinary, because I, I'll sh watch my next slide. And you can't, people in front can just make out this, this image here. That's the map. And it's a, um, a very detailed uh, map of um, shaded map showing the density of slaves in the United States uh, at the outbreak of the Civil War. And you can see the very dark areas, the Mississippi Delta, large numbers of slaves, dark areas, uh, coast of Georgia, in particular the coast of South Carolina. And that's, those are the two areas. New Orleans and South Carolina that are seized very early on in the war by amphibious operations of the Navy and the Army and uh, for, for strategic reasons, uh, in particular to facilitate the blockade and ultimately to facilitate an invasion that would cut off, uh, essentially cut off ever, the Confederacy uh, um, along the Mississippi River. But the result was the Union Army and the Union Navy found themselves in some of the uh, densest slave populations in the United States at the time. Hence the experience of the Vermonters in Louisiana. Lincoln gets his victory in September uh, at Antietam. It's a picture of him with McClellan, uh, not his necessary his favorite general. It was a great understatement. Um, and, and then he's prepared, within a few days of the Battle of Antietam, he makes the draft of the Emancipation Proclamation public. And the Emancipation Proclamation is done under his executive authority, his war powers. It's, it's an act he def defends out of military necessity. And I, 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 th I, I found this cartoon, and I think it, it you know, it, it probably is a, a good a cartoon as you can to sort of very simply explain this, what Lincoln's doing here. There's Abe, old Abe with his ax. He's not slaying a vampire here. He's, he's cutting down a tree, and, and, the, and the trunk of the tree is slavery. And there's the uh, uh, figure representing uh, the Confederacy up, on, uh, up in the upper part of the tree. He's going to cut this tree down, and the way he's going to win the war and defeat his, 
nemesis up in the tree is to, to, to take his ax to slavery. Now, um, the Emancipation Proclamation was um, uh, a limited action. It only uh, was directed against uh, um, the uh, slaves held in the Confederacy. And of course, some people say, well, you know, this couldn't have been very serious or it's hypocritical. He could have freed slaves that were under his control, and particularly in the border states. Um, so he, he, he went after the slaves, he, he, a lot of them he, that he couldn't easily free and didn't free the ones he could easily free. But in, in effect, um, you know, he had to send a message. And this was a very, as I said, a very careful political triangulation on the part of Lincoln. He had to send, send a message that, in fact, he was going to, uh, if he could weaken slavery where it was the strongest, he figured everything else would fall into place. Um, and so he, he, he went after slavery uh, in the Deep South, and, and by just the course of the war, he was, they were in a position, in fact, to have a great influence, particularly in South Carolina and, and uh, in the Mississippi Delta. Let's see if I can uh, bring it back here. Hang on. Yeah, uh, here we go. Lincoln's last warning. And, it, and the caption is now, if you don't come down, I'll cut the tree from out from under you. And uh, Lincoln essentially releases the uh, draft Emancipation Proclamation, uh, gives the South about 90 days or 100 days to end the rebellion, or it would go into effect. And, and uh, sure enough, uh, 1st of January, 1863, um, Emancipation Day, um, he, he, the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. And before Lincoln uh, affixes his signature, people are, are really wondering if he's going to go through with it. He says, if my name ever goes down in history, it will be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. Um, for the uh, African-American population, both free, and there are about half a million people uh, of color who are free at this point, mostly living in the North, though not exclusively, and about four million slaves in, uh, um, in the border states, but mainly in the South, this is the day of Jubilee. Um, now, when Lincoln issues his Emancipation uh, Proclamation, there's a very important clause in it, and he uh, also uses the proclamation to announce that from this point forward, African Americans would be uh, invited to serve in both uh, the Navy and the Army, um, and will be trained for military service as soldiers of the United States Army and Navy. Before the war is over, there, is, there are about 180,000 um, African Americans in either the Navy or the Army. It's, a, it's, it's a, almost 10 percent of the Union Army. Um, so under this uh, mantle of war necessity, there's also a, a very clear calculus here, is um, this is a time of uh, brutal conscription, both north and south. Manpower is drying up. We're uh, getting beyond the age of uh, volunteer regiments, and um, manpower is scarce. And all of a sudden, there's this really untapped uh, well of uh, men who are willing to fight. Um, now, part of the story, uh, going back to Vermont, uh, is an interesting one. Um, they need officers for black regiments, and they need white officers. Uh, they want people of military experience, and um, they go to the 8th Vermont that's uh, still in Louisiana. This is before the regiment was shipped up, uh, up north again, and as many of you know, fought in the Battle of Cedar Creek. They're still in Louisiana in 1862 and 1863. And they recruit 41 uh, soldiers from the 8th Vermont, and they offer them commissions to serve in colored regiments, the new colored regiments. And 41, ex I don't know how many were offered, but 41 accept the commissions and transfer out of the 8th Vermont and become officers in the new United States Colored Infantry Regiments. And um, 
couldn't, there aren't many, there isn't a lot of documentation, certainly not a lot of photographs of the men who made this decision. Uh, and this was a difficult decision made given the, the general ambient racial prejudice of the time, North and South. Um, and uh, there were other risks involved with um, accepting these commissions as officers in these new regiments, and I'll mention them in a moment. But I did find photographs of uh, three of those 41 Vermonters. Um, uh, Lieutenant Rufus Kingsley, he's the, 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 the fellow who wrote the diary entry I read. Um, Hiram, Major Hiram Perkins, he was from St. Albans. Uh, and there's a second Lieutenant Augustine Hawley from uh, Barnett, Vermont. Um, they all accept, these are three of the uh, many who accept commissions. There is also one soldier from this area, from Burlington, who also accepts a commission. Now here's a picture of some Union officers in a colored regiment. Uh, the reason why this was a risky proposition in particular, number one, uh, they were going to have to remain in the Deep South. and None of them wanted to, you know, that was not an attractive feature of this offer. Uh, you know, the rest of the regiment was going to move north uh, to Virginia. Uh, Louisiana was a dreadful place to serve. Um, you know, the big three uh, dangers in Louisiana were, were the, the fourth was the Confederates. The first three was uh, dysentery, typhoid, and malaria. Um, and, it was, it, and so staying that down in the South uh, was a risky proposition for a number of reasons. But in particular, uh, Jefferson Davis issued an executive order of his own at that time. And he, first he says that uh, this General Hunter, from, who was in uh, South Carolina, and uh, uh, our own um, General Phelps, if they were ever captured by the Confederacy, they were going to be considered outlaws, not um, senior officers. And, and that in, 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 if any of them were captured, um, they'd be outlaws. But in fact, any commissioned officer, white officer, who's found, who has been serving in any capacity with black soldiers, if he's captured as a prisoner of war in the battlefield, he will be regarded uh, not as a prisoner of war, but as a felon held in close confinement for execution. Um, so that is also not a big incentive to, um, um, now, these are, uh, these Vermont boys are pretty thrifty, however, and you know, they, they have to sort of take things into account. They'll, they'll be getting an officer's pay, um, but there's probably something more there because it's, a, it's, it's taking a, a, a pretty substantial risk. Um, now, Abraham Lincoln is not, um, doesn't take this completely lying down either, and, and in effect, he, he uh, issues an order of his own which says that um, uh, don't forget that there uh, are tens of thousands of Confederate prisoners of war in northern prisoner camps and that if you do anything to these uh, officers, um, there will be a retribution, um, tit for tat. Uh, but he goes further and he says if you do anything and, and the threat for, to, uh, there was a threat made against, of course, the colored soldiers, the African-American soldiers, the threat there was if they were captured um, and they weren't executed on the spot, they would be uh, uh, put into permanently into slavery again. Now, some were former slaves. Many were free blacks from the North who had enlisted in these colored regiments as well. They would become slaves too. They'd never been slaves, they would be slaves. And so Lincoln has to respond to that too. And he says, well, if you, if you enslave any uh, black soldiers in these regiments, we will take the equivalent number of prisoners out of Confederate camps. We'll start with South Carolinians. <laughs> and we'll put them into hard labor. Um, so uh, the, uh, Lincoln makes sure that there's a clear message that the, the government is going to cover the backs of these uh, soldiers, white and black. And in fact, the threat of um, most of the threat, though there were many African-American soldiers who were executed, in a couple of cases, um, the threat is not carried out. Uh, and there's no, uh, in fact, no Vermont officer who is captured, and several are captured, uh, who are in fact executed. But it is clear that the world is changing. 
and the decision to, um, once the decision is made that they're going to take 180,000 people of color and incorporate into the United States Army, the world is never going to be the same. And Lincoln, uh, certainly by about 1864, is under a lot of pressure because, uh, you know, Grant is uh, slogging his way uh, on his overland campaign at that point in time in the wilderness. Atlanta hadn't been captured. It's still under siege. Uh, Lincoln has to face re-election in 1864. He's very dubious if he can get re-elected. Uh, the war is, uh, the cost of the war is going up by the day. Um, and uh, he's, the, the people plead with him to enter into some kind of negotiated settlement of the war. And Lincoln says, I will finally, I will, he finally agrees, I will meet uh, 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 commissioners from the South, but there are uh, two non-negotiable non-negotiable conditions for any negotiations. And those two conditions are restore the Union and emancipation of all slaves. Those are his preconditions. And of course, those pre, you know, that, that latter precondition um, uh, is a no-starter for any negotiations with the South. But Lincoln knows, I think, and he realizes that, the, you know, he says at one point, broken eggs cannot be mended. Broken eggs cannot be mended. He realizes that, in fact, uh, there has been such revolutionary change in terms of the Emancipation Proclamation and the events surrounding it that you just cannot put it, you cannot return, you cannot have a reunification of this country under a pre-war status quo. You can't go back. And uh, I think he understands exactly what Frederick Douglass was talking about when uh, Douglas said, once you let a, a black person, and, and I'm not going to read this verbatim, but once you let a black person wear the uniform of the United States Army, have a cartridge belt with U.S. stamped on it and an, an eagle um, on his uniform and uh, a rifle in his hand, uh, basically the world has changed. And there's, as he says, he has earned the right of citizens, citizenship in the United States. And there was no way of ever turning that around. And as Lincoln says, uh, a promise being made must be kept. Now to re uh, return to Vermont and sort of sum up this uh, chain of events, uh, Lincoln, of course, has to stand for re-election uh, in 64. This is a handbill. Uh, from the opposition, the Democratic Party, elect Lincoln and you'll have more drafts uh, and ruin, uh, elect McClellan, you'll have union, a reunion and peace. Um, but, at the, but at the price of emancipation, Lincoln will not budge. Uh, he goes to, they goes to the polls. Fortunately, he has a little wind at his back. Uh, Atlanta has been captured. Um, um, Early has been defeated in the Shenandoah Valley, and uh, Vermonters stand fast behind their president. Uh, when they go to the polls in November of 1864, Vermonters cast 76% of their votes for Lincoln. Um, a few months later, uh, Lincoln pushes forward with the 13th Amendment, um, which is the constitutional amendment which officially banned slavery uh, uh, anywhere in the United States. Slavery is finished. Uh, it goes to Vermont for a vote. Uh, there's a, a, a vote in Montpelier. Um, and the legislature uh, ratifies the 13th Amendment without a dissent, unanimously. This is a photograph, I, I have to say, I threw this in because this is a photograph from Farmer's Night about a year ago. Anybody, was anybody there in the audience for that event? This is our, our current political leadership here. Uh, I think that's Senator Campbell, uh, Lieutenant Governor Scott, and uh, Speaker Smith. Um, they were good sports and uh, were made up especially for a recreation of uh, the Vermont legislature at the eve of the war. Um, but uh, you know you could be uh, uh, proud of these guys for um, uh, uh, being good sports then, but certainly they, uh, we were certainly proud of the Vermont legislature in 1864 when they 1864 when they took this vote. 
Uh, one last sort of footnote on history. Um, of course, the Civil War never really ends, with, certainly not with Appomattox. The, the events of surrounding what I'm talking about tonight sort of spin off uh, and have continued right up through to this day. Uh, the long struggle for civil rights uh, just began with the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. But Vermonters got involved sort of early on, and this is a little footnote of history talking about learning something every day and something new. Um, I found that there are, in fact, two uh, veterans of the 8th Vermont who decide uh, when uh, the war is finally over not to go home right away. And they uh, are, in effect, uh, ag agree to be uh, detailed to something called the Freeman's Bureau, which was a, a government welfare agency, if you will. It's a that was set up to try to ease the transition of this huge body of slaves, uh, former slaves, into uh, productive citizens. Uh, you, know, you can imagine it was a humanitarian crisis of uh, with millions of uh, newly freed people trying to find a way to deal with uh, uh, food and, and medicine, medical care, and education. And uh, the Freeman's Bureau was set up by the United States Congress to assist uh, this population um, make this transition. And uh, there was a, a gentleman from Georgia, uh, Vermont, uh, Charles Colton, uh, uh, from the 8th Vermont, served in the color regiment, and then became commissioner of Freeman schools in Louisiana. And he was a district attorney and, and school superintendent in Wilcox County, Alabama. So he stays to try to aid reconstruction. Um, there's another Vermont uh, soldier in the same, uh, from the same uh, unit from the 8th Vermont who serves with the 99th U.S. Colored Infantry, um, Warren Stickney from Brookline. Stickney eventually becomes superintendent of colored schools in New Orleans um, and later quartermaster in the educational department of the Freeman's Bureau. Freeman's Bureau tried to do a little bit of everything to ease this transition. Uh, so these Vermonters uh, stick with it, the transition from um, regular uh, army service into the, the colored regiments and then, in fact, after the war into the Freeman's Bureau. So I love this old photograph um, of a uh, turn of the century photograph of uh, a handful of Civil War veterans, black and white. Uh, this is actually in Woodstock, Vermont. Um, sitting, uh, sort of taking their uh, leisure, um, watching the stage come in. Um, but uh, I use this photograph just to um, say that 150 years, we have this perspective of 150 years now, that uh, I think we can say that Vermonters did more than their full duty. And uh, went above and beyond their full duty as this war transitioned from initially a war for the Union to a war for a more perfect Union. And that's uh, all I'm going to say uh, in formal remarks and pictures. And uh, if we can have the lights, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. And Yeah, I was asked if there, they, uh, I mentioned there were two new books on Lincoln and what were the books. In fact, there are more than two books, new books on Lincoln. Um, Bill, how many books are published on Lincoln every year? Dozens. However, the two I would recommend on this subject, on, on emancipation, that are excellent, um, and one, was, one came out about a year ago or two years ago, was Eric Foner's <coughs> Fiery Trial. Abraham Lincoln and Slavery. Uh, Eric Foner is a professor at Columbia University and a s superb scholar of uh, uh, slavery and, and Reconstruction. The other book um, is Howard Holzer. Holzer's a, a, a really preeminent Lincoln scholar. And, and he's written like 40 books on the Civil War. But his latest book is a slip of a book. Uh, and, and if you want one fascinating, quick read, it's his book, Emancipating Lincoln. And it's a, um, 
Holzer is, is um, in fact, uh, he gave uh, Vermont Humanities uh, First Wednesday's talk um, about a, last year sometime uh, in um, uh, Norwich. Actually, it was, it was over the, well, he, superb book. Um, but he really looks at the complexities and the subtleties of Lincoln's maneuvering up to the issuing of the emancipation. Um, keep in mind one thing. This Lincoln feared the, the, uh, the consequences of announcing an emancipation. Uh, he feared that, number one, there might be a military coup in the Union Army to remove him from his office. He feared the backlash would be so severe that he could be removed by force of arms. And at the very least, it would sink any chance to be reelected president. That the country was, this was such a revolutionary act. And you have to understand that while there were, you know, as I said, about half a million free people of color, uh, the vast majority were slaves. It was four million slaves. And that transition from uh, slavery into uh, ultimately into citizenship, there were huge fears of the unknown. People were just, uh, it was mind boggling. And so what Lincoln had to do would be number one, he had to first get people to think that it was possible. And number two, he had then had to get them to think it was inevitable. So, uh, you know, he is involved in this public relations campaign, if you will, to prepare public opinion. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, complicated and, and um, um, it's, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and people uh, who uh, <coughs> criticize Lincoln for being, you know, that he wasn't, um, questioned his resolve. And our own General Phelps was um, in that camp. There were a lot in Congress who questioned Lincoln. They said, he's just so slow. Uh, you know, he's, he, all he does is tell stories and he's, he's too, he, he doesn't, he's not strong enough and he's, he's not forceful enough. I think Lincoln understood the political challenge of preparing the nation for this, a, a, a transition of this magnitude. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot that he did. Um, there's an exchange of letters with Horace Greeley, who's an uh, editor in New York, and, and his paper uh, came out with a big editorial slamming Lincoln for being so slow on, on emancipation. Lincoln probably realized that this was going to happen, and he apparently had his answer already written before the editorial was even printed. Uh, Lincoln wanted that criticism. Lincoln didn't want to seem that he was out in front. Lincoln wanted to appear that he was catching up to events. And, and his response to really was, um, and he gets criticized for this response, very interesting. He says, if I could save the Union by uh, freeing all the slaves, I'd do it. If I could save the Union by not freeing many slaves, I'd do it. Well, people say, well, here he is on the, on the eve of issuing his Emancipation Proclamation, and he hasn't made up his mind. <laughs> well, Halzer, his interpretation, and I think it's a valid one, is Lincoln wanted to put out there, across the North, the possibility that emancipation could happen. And this was his way of, um, in a way, putting it out there uh, and preparing people that it wasn't necessarily going to happen, but it could happen. And get your minds around that, that it could happen. That the war might make it essential. He was preparing his ground. Was there a book about the Vermonters attacking New Orleans? I don't think I knew about that. So why don't I look for more information? I'm writing one, so oh, good. you've got to be patient. <laughs> You'll have to come back. Yeah, as far as I know, it's very hard. There are diaries, there are letters. Uh, it's a very interesting story. I've heard of it. Yeah, I mean, you really think about it. The title of this whole talk is, you know, from, in this case, from Chittenden County to Baton Rouge. It, 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 it's a very interesting story because it took people who were, you know, they, you, 
Vermonters fought for a whole variety of reasons. They signed up for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, it's an interesting question. You know, they, 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 a lot of them felt that, um, basically felt that the covenant they had with the American Revolution had been breached by the, by the secession. That uh, they had, there was a social contract in this country that you had presidential elections every four years. And if the election went your way, well, good for you. If the election didn't go your way, well, that's the contract. You know, we just had an election last night, and you know, it doesn't matter who you voted for, there's a new president, or there's, a, there's someone in, who won that election, and this country moves forward under its laws and respects the results of the election. What they were so angry about, is that uh, the fact that the election was held and then the results were nullified and rejected. And they felt that was actually a break with their fidelity to the, to the they felt very, they had inherited the American Revolution and this is what they had inherited, this, this republic. And this was a, a violation or a break with that covenant. Now, once they got down there, uh, you know, their their feelings about slavery evolved. They, they, they you know, they, there was a lot of prejudice, a lot of uh, ill will towards people of color, but they really hated slavery. And the reason why they got so angry at slavery is that they recognized that they wouldn't be in Louisiana. They wouldn't be, you know, suffering from malaria and dysentery being shot at if it hadn't been for slavery. And th the army, <coughs> slowly but surely comes to the realization that they don't want a reunification without the destruction of slavery because they fear, rightly or wrongly, their perception is it could happen again. As long as the slavery issue is unresolved, five years, ten years later, they could find themselves back to Louisiana fighting the war all over again. So they felt that the, 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 there had to be, uh, had, the, the river had to be crossed. And they had to, in effect, deal with slavery once and for all and go home. So there's this sort of shift in opinion. It's not a, you know, a feeling of uh, you know, brotherhood and equality, but it is a feeling that slavery brought on this war and they were, they were going to deal with it uh, once and for all. Uh, what about Phelps? What happens to him for the remainder of the war? Uh, again, no good book on Phelps. Um, uh, a lot written about him. At some point, he in fact runs for runs for president later on in 1870s. Uh, not on a major ticket. He's a he's a, he is a funny guy. He's you know he's he's a full of contradictions. Um, he comes back to Vermont and uh, he's. You know, he, again, he's a little ahead of his time, and so when the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, all of a sudden it's the national policy to enlist, you know, 100,000 black troops. Lincoln uh, appeals to Phelps, offers him a, a, a commission <coughs> in the Union Army. In fact, he's, he's offered to become superintendent of all colored troops in the United States Army. He's, and, but Phelps is a prickly guy, and, and he insists that his commission be retroactive to the day he was forced out. And, you know, the war is going on, and Lincoln doesn't have time for this, really. So, it, you know, they, they just don't want to deal with him. He's just too, he's a little cantankerous. He's a, you know, he's a, uh, I won't say it, but, you know, he, he, you know he's stubborn, he's, he's a little, he's very independent. Um, but, you know, he, he rep you know, people have dismissed him as being, um, this is a little bit of history that it's, just doesn't get much attention. And what Phelps, Phelps doesn't just rep represent one strong-willed uh, military officer. He represents um, a growing movement in the United States Army that is putting pressure on Lincoln and putting pressure on Congress to pick up the pace of the game. And while they sacrifice themselves ultimately, and they put their careers on the line, and they sacrifices, sacrifice their careers, I'm sure, in fact, Lincoln was feeling the pressure. And Lincoln was aware of all the, these tens of thousands of slaves who had uh, fled to uh, that Union camp under the uh, Golden Arches. 
And uh, he was aware that, and there were tens of thousands of slaves that had that fled over the uh, Potomac River and, and crossed into Washington, D.C. for protection. Um, and you know, you, you don't have to be a, um, read a crystal ball to realize that the world's never going to be the same. You, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. Um, and that he had to do something. A hundred years ago, <laughs> um, we have here four veterans of the Civil War, one of whom was black. I'm curious about how many blacks settled in Vermont at that time. And the reason that I ask that question is that my brother was a student at UVM in the 1960s, and a sociology class that he was in did a census that year of the number of people of color in Vermont. And I remember very well that it was someplace under 500 at that time, in 1965. I'm wondering what it was in 1865, just after the war. You know, I don't have a precise number. It was not very many. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, um, there, are, um, there are quite a number out of that community that existed. There are quite a number who did, in fact, jump, join up and did fight in the war. They, they were not enough to create a, a, a colored regiment in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So they served with other regiments. And there are a number from uh, this town who served uh, in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Right. And the 54th is famous for its uh, uh, movie Glory and the attack on Fort Wagner in, in Charleston Harbor. Um, the town of Woodstock um, sent uh, 13 fathers and sons a free people of color mm -hmm. out of a population, just to, I know I know this statistic, the 1860 census said there were 60 free souls, that's uh -huh. men, women, and children, uh -huh. in the town of Woodstock in 1860, and they sent 12 off to war. That's a... That's a lot. Yeah, that's a <laughs> yeah. lot if you're, if you're looking at the entire population. Yeah. Uh, they're all buried in River Street Cemetery. Uh -huh. They're all buried with um, GA... G.A.R. Honors, Grand Army of the uh -huh. Republic Honors. Um, it was, uh, after the war, it was an integrated uh, mm -hmm. veterans post uh, in Woodstock, but that was not the case across the country. And what you see is, uh, after the war, is this segregation, if you will, of veterans. Um, um, and as they were segregated during military service, they're segregated in terms of um, um, not always being invited in many cases, and certainly by the turn of the century, they're not being really included in uh, celebrations and uh, commemorations. In fact, the commemorations are, by, by 1913, it's the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, um, that's really a, a, an all-white affair, North and South. And uh, it's, 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 I think, representative that a lot of the progress that was made during the war, and certainly this story and, uh, and, and sort of the, the accomplishments of the war are, are not reversed, but they're largely uh, put on hold as the country slips into a, a, almost a century of national amnesia. And I'll just, I'll just give you one example, and, and uh, we'll call it a night. Uh, when the Lincoln Memorial is dedicated in 1920, this is Abraham Lincoln's statue in Washington, D.C. There is no mention of slavery. All there is a mention, there's a war and the importance of reunification. There is no mention of slavery. And it takes, in fact, it, it, it takes another uh, 15 years to uh, when Marian Anderson, the singer, was a black singer was uh, trying to find a venue in Washington to perform, and she was, was closed out of a number of venues, uh, that the Secretary of the Interior at the time, um, Ickes, Harold Ickes, uh, offers, and Mrs. Roosevelt offers the Lincoln Memorial to Marian Anderson to sing and, 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 uh, to, as a venue for her concert. And it's her performance that, in, and in fact, reconsecrates, rededicates the Lincoln Memorial to uh, racial progress and civil rights. Um, so, you know, it's, it, the, the, it takes time. I think you have further questions. Maybe we'll stay a few minutes after. Is one announcement? Thank you. I'm Bill McCollum. I live up by Smuggler's Notch. I had to come down here. 
wonderful education they managed to put these things in focus. Um, those of you who have an interest, in, particularly in the Civil War, we're forming some discussion groups in the area. I'd be happy to take down your name and put you on an uh, email list, and uh, we'll be holding a GAR uh, oriented, uh, because of Route 15 being the GAR highway, uh, a roundtable discussion about the Civil War periodically and, and areas along there. So, and, and Bill is a Civil War uh, historian and, and writer, and is also a member of the Civil War 150th uh, Commission for Vermont. Good Somebody man enough. Somebody called it the Semi-Consequential Commission. <laughs> <laughs> I have some reaction forms if you'd like to, to respond to the next program, and I really thank you all.